Welcome to the Way of the Master. In this program, we've taught you over and over how to share your faith simply, effectively, and biblically the way Jesus did. And you've seen footage of us on the streets, in airplanes, in taxi cabs, at parks, at festivals, witnessing to some of the hardest people in the world, gang members, cult members, atheists, people of false religions. But today, we're going to focus in on the most terrifying group of people to witness to. These are by far the hardest type of people to share your faith with. My palms are sweating just thinking about it. That's what we're going to talk about when we come back. Seek and save the lost the way Jesus did. There's only a certain amount of time left. Time left. Time left. So use the law and use your testimony to reach out to the lost. Reach out to the lost. There's nothing more important than your eternal salvation. I've been sharing my faith for over 30 years. I've preached open air thousands of times. And yet, you know what my biggest, my greatest weakness is? It's known as Ray's best kept secret. My greatest fear, my greatest weakness is witnessing to family members. I mean, that terrifies me. Oh, me too. Yeah, I mean, you can give me a 10,000 atheist, angry atheist, and stick me in front of them and say, preach to them, I'll do it gladly with no great problem. joy. No problem, no problem. But you know what? Stick me in front of my mom and say, talk to her about the things of God. I get terrified. You know, I was brought up in a non-Christian home, and the thing that bothered me is why people die. You know, I, I was, this is around the time that man was trying to put a man on the moon, and I, I had these thoughts, and yet we don't even know what we're doing here on Earth. We're trying to cure the common cold, and yet no one's doing anything about the aging process. I mean, people are just dying daily, yeah, and no one's saying anything. Death. Yeah, and it's, it's like, it was an embarrassing question to ask people, but I was asking it myself. And I remember one night, my wife was asleep, I was newly married, and I looked at her and I began to weep and say, why could she die just like that? Why are my mum and dad gonna die? And I remember tears were streaming down my cheeks as I asked that question, why? And God heard that prayer, and six months later, I was soundly saved. I gave my life to Christ, received God's gift of everlasting life, found immortality. And I was so pumped. I was so excited. This was real. It wasn't pie in the sky when you die. God gives you the gift of everlasting life. So the first people I wanted to tell was my mom and dad. So I waited for a whole two weeks, and then I got mom and took her aside. And for a whole hour, I poured my heart out to her. I said, all have sinned. I want you to go to heaven when you die. Please say this prayer. Did the same with my dad. Now my mom prayed the prayer that night. And she became a Christian? Well, I thought so. Next morning, I took her to meet some Christians. And I said, this is my mom. She's just given her life to Christ. And they said, praise the Lord. Gave her a big hug and she went stiff as a board. <laughs> and she took me aside later and said, you know, last night when I prayed that prayer with you, I did it for you. I didn't do it to become a Christian. I did it because you wanted me to. And it was so disappointing. And it's taken uh -huh. about 30 years for that to heal, you know. And there's nothing more important than, than witnessing to your family members. You care about the most. Absolutely. I, I um, was just told by um, my mother that there's a relative of mine who's a little upset with me. And it's because of the fact that I took the time to witness to her. And I love her so much. I wanted to talk about the hard issues. And she admitted to lying and to stealing. And I, I, I thought this was a great thing because now she could see her need for a savior. But I've learned that she's actually really embarrassed about the fact that I see her as a, a lying thief. And I'm not trying to say that as much as God sees you for who you are in truth and therefore we need to come to Him uh, for salvation and, and a new heart. But with a family relationship, it just seems to get so convoluted and tied up in, in, in so much and it's so much harder than sharing your faith with a complete stranger, don't you think? Let me tell you about my brother. He was over in the States some time ago and I was on a plane with him and I hadn't confronted him. And this was my opportunity. He was sitting next to me and I, I said, 
what do you think happens after you die? And he just joked the whole thing off. And I was so disappointed. I was so earnest. And he just laughed it off. I just didn't want to talk no, about it. No, no. And it was, it was so awkward and so difficult. Um, and I, I was speaking to my brother-in-law some years ago. And I hadn't spoken to him for 15 years about the things of God. I'd lived the life. And I thought, this is my opportunity. You're walking through a forest together. And as I turned to speak to him, I just got kind of tongue-tied, didn't know where I was going with it. In the back of my mind, I thought, if I upset him, I'm going to upset my sister, because he's going to tell my sister or tell my mother, and there is, there is Raymond doing his thing again and pushing <laughs> religion down the throat of the family. I know. It's horrible. I, I remember... Um, wanting to share my faith with someone that I love so much, my wife's brother. And he's just one of these guys that y you love him, but sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to, to talk with him because he's kind of a gruff guy. And when he tells you and speaks his mind, boy, it kind of feels like he's hitting you with both barrels. And so you kind of got to be prepared for a serious conversation. And uh, it was around Christmas time. There was three feet of snow on the ground. And I thought, I'm going to make a couple of mugs of hot chocolate, go in there and just talk about the Lord. And so I first took the hot chocolate out into the snow, up to my knees, and I'm just praying, Lord, give me courage. Help me not to chicken out of this. Come on, this is important, please. I walked back in the house, realized the coffee was cold, put it in the microwave, nuked it. Was it went, coffee or hot chocolate? Oh, it was hot chocolate. Got it hot again, went back to his office. The door was closed, and I just paced for about 10 minutes, just getting up the courage to go in there. I knocked on the door, went in, and I said, hey, I've got some hot chocolate. And he took one sip and said, yeah, but it's cold. Ah, oh, it already started off bad. Um, well, I sat down and, and uh, said, hey, you know, I'd just like to talk to you about something important. I'd like, like to just tell you where I'm coming from with this whole Christianity stuff and why I believe this. And I said, can I just have three minutes of your time? And he kind of said he was busy, didn't really have time for it. Please, three minutes, I'll feel so much better. I'll sleep better tonight if you let me talk to you about this. And he said, well, if that's what it means to be a good brother-in-law, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Whoa, okay. Uh, my life before Christ, when I became a Christian, what I've learned, what it means to me now. And my three minutes was up and he kind of said, okay, let's go. And, you know, we went on with the rest of the vacation and I just felt, ah, did I get it all outright? And I just felt, why is this so much harder than when I'm talking to a stranger? It seems like so much more is at stake. With a stranger, if someone gets upset, if they're offended at the things of God, you really haven't lost anything. There's nothing at stake. But with a family member, everything's at stake. If they get upset, then the whole family could get upset with you. And we just have to remember that, that sometimes the people closest to us, they know our shortcomings and they'll bring them up when we try to talk about God. Isn't that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, if, if we're going to, if we care about our loved ones, the ones we call loved ones, we've got to confront them. We've got to ask them, what do you think happens after you die? Because yeah. we're concerned about their mortality, where they spend eternity. So that's what this program is going to be about. We're going to look at principles of how to reach those that you love. Okay. This program is not just about sharing your faith, but specifically sharing with someone you know and love, someone who's close to you. And we're going to give you six keys on how to reach them. So if you have a pen and paper, you might want to write these keys down. Six keys to reaching your loved ones. The first key goes without saying, pray for your loved ones. Pray for them without ceasing. Now there's a certain type of prayer that moves the hand of God. It's believing prayer. Jesus said, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. The scripture also says, God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. So there's the promise of God. Trust the Lord with all your heart. And remember, salvation is of the Lord. No man can come to the Son unless the Father draws them. So put the loved ones into the hands of God and thank Him for His faithfulness. And don't be afraid to tell them that you're praying for them. The second key to reaching your loved ones is make sure that you're living a life that is blameless. In other words, don't be a hypocrite. Don't gossip. Be careful of the movies that you're watching, the magazines that you're reading, the TV shows that you're laughing at. You know, are you telling dirty jokes? Are you doing things that give people the impression that you don't live what you say you believe? You know, a famous preacher named Charles Spurgeon once said that if at home you're living the life of a hypocrite, he said, before you open up your mouth for God, you should go two miles outside of your town. And then, when you're two miles out and you stand up to speak, you should say nothing. 
The worst thing that we can do is be a hypocrite. If we really want to reach our loved ones, we must live a life of integrity and one that is blameless. Key number three, and this is a difficult one, but if we care about our loved ones, we must speak to them clearly and directly about their salvation at least once. So how are you going to do this? Go to grandma and say, Grandma, have you ever lusted? Have you ever lied or stolen? That's a little bit too direct. The way to handle it is in testimonial form. Use first person. Say, Grandma, I realized when I die, I have to face God on judgment day. And he's going to judge me by the Ten Commandments. And I realized I'd lied and stolen. And in God's eyes, I was a lying thief. And Jesus said, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Grandma, I'd be guilty on that day. What about you? And remember to exalt the cross and preach repentance and faith. And the best time to speak with people is when they're alone. So look for those situations when people are alone so you can speak to them about their salvation. Grandma, I feel very nervous because I love you and I don't want to offend you. But this is so important. One day, we're all going to die. Do you ever think about what happens? The Bible says that God will judge every one of us according to His standards of goodness. And if I've lied, if I've stolen, which I have, if I've taken God's name in vain, then from God's point of view, I'm a lying thief and a blasphemer, and I'm going to be guilty, and I'm going to need God's forgiveness. What about you, Grandma? Have you broken God's commandments? Have you ever sinned against the Lord? Do you need His forgiveness? Now, of course, I couldn't get a real interview with my grandmother, but we're going to go out on the streets and show you how to use your testimony as an easier way to have a conversation about the gospel. Isn't she cute? <laughs> but I was only 20 years old, and I realized I was part of the ultimate statistic. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the Bible, and the Bible says, the soul that sins, it shall die. The reason we die, the Bible says, is because we've sinned against God. But I didn't see myself as a sinner. I mean, I wasn't. There was plenty of people worse than me. Mm -hmm. But the thing that helped me is when I looked at the Ten Commandments. You shall not lie. I'd lied. Mm -hmm. You shall not steal. I'd stolen. Just little things. Mm -hmm. But the one that got me was this. Jesus said, you've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. And I thought, well, that's sweet. I've never done that. I'll make it to heaven if there is one. But then I saw his words. Mm -hmm. But I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her, has committed adultery already with her in his heart. I thought, whoa, I'm in big trouble on judgment. You and Jimmy Day. Carter. Oh, yeah. Well, every, <laughs> every red-blooded male. I thought, yeah, all lusted in your yeah. mind. So if, if God's seen our thought life, I thought, on the day of judgment, I'm going to be guilty and end up in hell. And when I acknowledged that, I understood why Christ died on the cross. When he came to this earth, he came to suffer and die for our sins. The Bible says on that cross, he was bruised for our iniquities. Mm -hmm. God's anger yeah. came upon him so we could go free, a substitutionary death. We broke the law, Jesus paid our fine. And then the Bible says he rose from the dead and defeated death. And if we'll repent and trust in him, God will forgive us and grant us the gift of everlasting life. So what about you? Do you think you have sinned against God when you look at the commandments? Oh, yeah. So you realize so you've lied? Yeah. Stolen? No. Ever use God's name in vain? Yeah. That's blasphemy. I know. It's using God's name as a cuss word. I know, I know. Ever looked with lust? Even once? Oh, yeah. So you committed adultery in your heart. So, yes. So by your own admission, lying, blasphemous, adulterous heart, mm -hmm. adulterous at heart. So if you face God on judgment day, will you be innocent or guilty if he judges you by the commandments? I would be guilty, yes. Would you go to heaven or hell? I would hope that he'd be forgiving. Because if you believe in Jesus, you are forgiven. So have you repented? Are you trusting in the Savior? Are you born again? I'm not a born again Christian. Do you know what? You, let me see if I can clarify what born again is because it's a, a phrase that's used a lot. Being born again and believing in Jesus is like believing in a parachute and actually putting it on. There's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You don't see the difference until you jump. See? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so you can believe in Jesus, but mm -hmm. God doesn't want your acknowledgement of the existence of Christ. He wants you to trust in the Savior, mm -hmm. like you trust a parachute to save you. Okay. So what you must do to be forgiven is repent and trust in Jesus. The moment you do that, God says, I'll remit your sins, I'll forgive you, and grant you the gift of everlasting life. Do you have a Bible at home? Yes. If you were to die right now, Reno, where do you think you'd go? Somewhere in between. 
there's no in-between. Oh, well, there has to be <laughs> for people like me. <laughs> well, there's no, we're all like you, and the Bible says if God gives us justice, we'd end up in hell. I remember the first time that Ray and his wife came over to our house for dinner, and <clears throat> I was so grateful because Ray took the time to witness to my father and share his faith with him. And he even ended up praying with my father. There was also an opportunity that I had to go out to lunch with Ray and his mother and his brother. And during that lunch, I was able to share my testimony with them and even ask them about their faith. And I know I was grateful that Ray did that for me. And I'm sure that he was, that I was able to speak to his family members. And maybe you have a Christian friend that you could make an agreement with. You witness to their loved ones and they witness to your loved ones. And that gives an opportunity for the gospel to be shared and get around some of the, the tensions and obstacles that come with you sharing with your family members. So that's key number four. Make an agreement with a friend to share the gospel with one another's loved ones. Key number five, be rich in good works. Your family is not interested in your sermonizing. They want to see your faith by your works. For so is the will of God that by your well-doing you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. For many years I had my own business and I was very bold in my faith. My witness was very obvious. Around that time, a number of my friends died through drug overdoses. And I put out a pamphlet called My Friends Are Dying, warning young people about drugs, educating them. And that got national attention. My barber, who was next door to me, called me in once. He said, Ray, come here. I want to tell you something interesting. He said, when people came in to get their hair cut, they would sit in the seat and say, oh, what a fanatic next door. They wouldn't say anything else because they're so disgusted. But he said, since you put out that pamphlet, they come in, sit down and say, he's doing a good job, that young guy next door. What was happening? For so is the will of God that by your well-doing, you're put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And the same applies with your family. Be rich in good works. Get into doing some good work that's obvious. Jesus said, so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Do practical things. Buy flowers for your mother when it's not her birthday, it's not Christmas. Buy gifts for people, but be rich in good works that they may see your faith by your works. And the sixth key to reaching your loved ones, seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, prove yourself to be faithful to God and He will reward you. Study God's Word. Be faithful to read it every day. Learn how to share your faith simply and effectively the way that Jesus did. Learn to use the commandments to show a person how they've sinned against God and why they need a savior. And if you find it difficult to do this face to face with someone you love, send them an email or write them a letter. Just do something. Sometimes that's even better than face to face because they can take the time to read it and think about what you're saying. Also, don't pressure someone to make a decision. Remember, salvation is of the Lord and you don't want to manipulate a decision because sometimes they might do it just to make you feel better. Trust the Lord. Be faithful to share your faith, even with other people's loved ones. You share with another Christian's mother or father, brother or sister, maybe God will send some other Christian into the life of your loved one to share the gospel with them. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So we have looked at six keys on how to witness to your loved one, something that's kind of awkward for most of us. Now we're going to look at something that should come much easier, and that's how to bring your children to Christ. I love the way giraffes have offspring. They drop them from about six feet. Bang! The baby giraffe hits the ground, stands up in shock, and he wobbles for about an hour, and then he follows his mother, just walking after her. Well, with human beings, it takes about 18 years before they learn to walk on their own two feet. And what we're going to do is share principles with you on how to train up a child in the way he should go. The first principle is pretty obvious. We should set an example for our kids. If we want to lead our children to Christ, they should see that our faith in Christ is genuine. 
they should be able to tell that we genuinely love God with all our heart. We should love our spouse. We should love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. We should truly love God's word and read it every day, and we should share our faith with those who are lost. Be an example for your kids. The second principle is to establish a family altar out of the heavy rocks of resolution. What do I mean by that? Well, start family devotions daily and be resolute because you're going to have to be because there's going to be so many things that will come against you to discourage you. Your wife might be busy doing the dishes, your kids are playing, you want to see the news or read the newspaper. But which is more important, these, these temporal things or the eternal salvation of your children? So. If you're a father, call your family together. If you're a mother, if you're a single mother, take the lead. Call your family together and say, we're going to have family devotions and we're having it now. Let's sit down and open the Bible. Then open in prayer. Teach your children to pray. Just teach them to say, Lord, please help us to understand your word in Jesus' name. And then read through scripture, perhaps the Gospel of John, three or four or five verses each night, expounding the verses for your children. Teach them memory verses. And when they learn a verse, give them some sort of small reward. Act out Bible stories. I did that for many years. I played Goliath and let kids throw pillows at me or I was under a sheet being Lazarus and they raise him from the dead. What kids enter into, they tend to remember. Use anecdotes, use a little humor here and there. And whatever you do, don't make it last too long. Maybe 15, 20 minutes maximum. And when you're finished, make sure you close in prayer. And the third principle, teach your children the Ten Commandments. God's Ten Commandments are like a mirror that will show them that they have a sinful heart. They'll see that they've broken the commandments and sinned against God. Why is that important? Because it's only when they recognize that they've sinned against God that they will see their need for Jesus. Jesus came to save them from their sin, and they've got to see what their sin is, and the commandments will show them. So if you have kids, bring them to the television set right now because we want to teach you and your children how to memorize the Ten Commandments for life in just three minutes. All you have to do is concentrate on these pictures and then memorize them. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Look at the runner. He's coming in first. He's number one. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. That means God should be number one in your life. The second commandment is, you shall not make yourself any graven image. That is, don't bow down to anything but God. But look at that man. He's bowing down to an idol in the shape of a number two. The second commandment is, you shall not make yourself any graven image. Don't bow down to anything but God. The third commandment is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't use your lips to dishonor God. Look at those big red lips. They're dishonoring God, and they're in the shape of the number three. The third commandment is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The fourth commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Don't neglect the things of God. Look at that boy. He watches TV all the time and never gives special time to God. And he's inside the number four, reminding us that the fourth commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The fifth commandment is, honor your father and your mother. Look at mum and dad. Oh, they've shaped themselves into the number five, reminding us that the fifth commandment, number five, is honor your father and your mother. Uh-oh, look at that bomb. It could kill someone. And it's in the shape of the number six, reminding us the sixth commandment is, you shall not kill. The seventh commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. Adultery leaves a heart broken. Always be faithful to the one you marry. Look at that heart. Inside it is the number seven, and it's broken, reminding us that the seventh commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. The eighth commandment is, you shall not steal. Look at this burglar, this thief. He's trying to steal something. 
This mask is in the shape of a number eight, reminding us the eighth commandment is, you shall not steal. The ninth commandment is, you shall not lie. That means we should always speak the truth. Look at that nine. He's lying in bed. He's a lying nine, reminding us that the ninth commandment is, you shall not lie. The tenth commandment is, you shall not covet. We shouldn't want what others have. We shouldn't be greedy. Look at that greedy man looking through the doorway at the diamond ring. The doorway and the ring are in the shape of the number 10, reminding us that the tenth commandment is, you shall not covet. Remember, the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to bring the knowledge of sin, to show sin in its true light. The effect of that, it'll show them they need a Savior. That's why the Bible says the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We hope these six principles or keys for reaching a loved one have been helpful. We hope and pray that you can lead your children to Christ. Remember, it's important that you stay faithful to the Lord. Trust God. Salvation is of the Lord. And maybe there's someone saying, this is great, but this show has come too late for me. The damage has already been done. I already have a rift in the relationship, and they don't want to listen to me anymore. They think I'm a religious weirdo. Well, there might be a possibility that you need to apologize to them. Have you had a holier-than-thou attitude? Have you played the part of a hypocrite so they don't want to hear what you have to say? If that's the case, apologize and ask for a fresh start with them. If you've been faithful, then realize that salvation is in the hands of the Lord. Trust Him and learn to share your faith. Go to wayofthemaster.com, get a hold of the Evidence Bible, get a hold of the free materials, the Foundation Course, and the School of Biblical Evangelism. Sign up for our free email newsletter so that we can inspire and encourage you with fresh and new ideas on how to share your faith. Kirk, I want to close with this one testimony. My dad said he was a believer for years and we knew he was. There was no fruit. The whole family knew he wasn't genuine in his belief. But in his early 80s, he had a heart attack, a serious heart attack, and he had two weeks before he died. And in that two weeks, God gave him time to make peace with him and he was soundly saved truly born again in that two weeks. And people say to me, sorry to hear about your dad dying. And I say to them, oh, it's okay, it was nothing serious. And that's not said in flippancy. It's true, when a Christian dies, it is nothing serious. Death has lost its sting. The grave has truly lost its victory. So I know I'm gonna see him again. He is faithful to promise. So trust God with all your heart for the salvation of those that you love. this episode of Wave the Master has inspired you to share the message of eternal life. You can watch our award-winning movies such as The Atheist Delusion freely on our website, where you'll also find articles, videos, and audio messages, as well as books, DVDs, gospel tracts, and other resources to help you share your faith biblically and effectively. Make sure to visit livingwaters.com today.